This morning we will close out our time in Psalm 19. We're going to look at verses 12 through 14, the response to God's revelation in His Word. Over the last two weeks, we have considered God's revelation as revealed here in Psalm 19. First, the revelation of God in His world. And I emphasize His world because God created this world. God makes the rules for this world. Last week, we looked at the revelation of God in His Word. The Bible is the Word of God. So today, we consider the response to God's revelation in His Word. I hope you have your spot there. Psalm 19, verses 12 through 14. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse me from secret faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless, and I shall be innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Let's pray together. Kind and gracious Heavenly Father, you are so great. Lord, what a, what a privilege it is, Lord, to be reminded of that. Lord, to sing of your greatness. Father, I thank you that you have made yourself known in your world and in your word. Father, I pray that as we open up your word today, Lord, that I would say no more, no less than what you would have me to say. Father, I pray as David did that the, the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart would be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Lord, we know that your word is true. We know that your word is sufficient. So Father, we ask you now to sanctify us by your word, your word which is true. Father, I pray that uh, as John the Baptist did, that as we open up your word this morning, that Jesus would increase and that I would decrease. Father, we ask these things in the most holy name of Jesus our Lord. It's in his name. Amen. In these three verses this morning, we'll see that there is a plea to be cleansed from secret sins. There is a plea to be kept from presumptuous sins. And there is a plea for one's words and thoughts to be found acceptable in God's sight. Let's begin here at verse number 12, where we see a plea to be cleansed from secret sins. The Bible says, who can understand his errors? David is asking a question that he already knows the answer to. David is asking a question that if you and I are honest, we already know the answer to. The question that David is asking centers upon who can fully understand the depths of a person's heart. I can't. You can't. David couldn't. Only an all-knowing, holy, and righteous God can. Only the God who created you can. These errors that we see in verse 12, the word errors that we see in verse 12, will be further explained as we discuss the secret faults. But know this, as we see the question, who can understand his errors... That word errors points to sin that is committed not intentionally. It's, uh, it's errors that occur when we miss God's perfect and holy mark, whether we're not being attentive or we are ignorant of what we are doing. But know this, only God can plumb to the depths of our hearts and clearly see our errors. So look to the Bible, verse 12. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse me from secret faults. Now the secret faults here are not to be understood as sins that we keep secret from others. John MacArthur calls these secret faults sins we do not plan to commit 
and often do not remember to confess. These secret faults are like the errors that someone commits in their lives. They're committed in ignorance, and they're committed due to inattention. Think for just a moment, the religious leaders, as they petitioned Pilate to crucify Jesus. Consider their actions as they stood there looking upon Calvary's hill, and they hurled insults at the Savior of the world. As he hung from a cross, they hurled insults at Jesus as he was taking the sin of the world upon himself. Do you remember what Jesus prayed as he was up there on that cross for those who were hurling insults at him? The Bible tells us in Luke 23, verse 24, Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. You see, the religious leaders, they claimed that Jesus was blaspheming God. As Jesus was forgiving sin, as Jesus was claiming to be one with the Father, they were screaming blasphemy. Well, for any other man to have done this, it would have been blasphemy. But Jesus is not any other man. Jesus is the God-man. Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. So as those religious leaders were yelling for Jesus to be crucified, they felt what they were doing was right. Peter would go on to rebuke them in Acts chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. But you denied the Holy One and the just, and asked for a murderer to be granted to you, and killed the Prince of Life, whom God raised from the dead, of which we are witnesses. Peter goes on in verse 17, Yet now, brethren, I know that you did it in ignorance, as did also your fathers. Psalm 19, verse 12, Who can understand his errors? Cleanse me from secret faults. David's plea was that God would cleanse him from secret faults, that God would cleanse him from the sins of ignorance, from the sins of inattention. Cleanse here has in mind a declaration of innocence. David is saying, take these secret faults away from me. I don't want to be associated with them any longer. Purge them from my account. Now, perhaps you're here this morning and you say, well, listen, I know in my heart there are no errors or secret faults in my life. Well, the Bible says in Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Rather than trusting in our heart, which is deceitful above all things, a better approach is to recognize that there is an all-knowing God, and He knows our secret sins. The Bible says in Psalm 90, verse 8, You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your countenance. Sin, even in the life of a believer, creates a barrier to fellowship with God. The Bible says in Psalm 66, verse 18, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. We must instead pray and ask God to reveal our errors, reveal our secret faults. Ask God to show us the sins that we have been ignorant of. And we should pray as we're instructed in Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. And see if there is any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. You see, while our heart is deceitful and desperately wicked, the Bible says in Hebrews 4, 12, and 13, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. 
and there is no creature hidden from his sight. But all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. You see, as David gave consideration to the very word of God, it brought him to a place of self-examination. It brought him to a place of prayer, leading him to ask God, cleanse me from secret faults. Next, David makes a plea to be kept from presumptuous sins. Look to your Bible, verse number 13. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. MacArthur calls these presumptuous sins arrogant and premeditated sins that we commit even when we know better. These are the type of sins that we know where God has placed the line and we willfully step across it as we mock him in doing so. David's plea is not that he would keep himself from presumptuous sins. David's plea is that God would keep him from presumptuous sins. In 1 Samuel 25, and I'd encourage you to to make a note there, to to go back and read all of 1 Samuel 25. It's 44 verses. We're not going to cover them all this morning. But in 1 Samuel 25, we see an incredible example of God keeping David from making and committing a presumptuous sin. In 1 Samuel 25, there was a man by the name of Nabal. He was a very wealthy man, and it came time for him to to bring all of his sheep in so that they could shear the sheep. This was a big-time celebration. This was a time that a lot of money was going to be made. It It was a party. There was food. There was drink. There were all of these different things going on. Well, in 1 Samuel 25, David sends some of his men in to Nabal and says, Hey, we've been out in the field. We've kept watch of your men. No one has come in and harmed you. You could say they were like bodyguards for Nabal's men. And they said, we'd like you to share in some of this party. Give us some of the food. Give us some of the drink. And Nabal said, no, I have no idea who you are. I'm not giving you anything. And so David's men, they turned around. And they went back to David. And they said, David, he told us he's not giving us a thing. Well, that was hugely insulting to David. And so David says to his men, he says, Guys, get your gear. We're going into town, and we're going to take out Nabal. We're going to take out everybody in his household. Nabal's wife hears about this, and she goes, Oh, my goodness, I cannot believe what my foolish husband has done. And she gathers all kinds of food, all kinds of drink, and she takes off to meet David before he comes in. And she gives all of this to David, and she pleads with him. She said, David, you're going to be the king. You don't want this blood on your hands. Don't go in and destroy this city because of what my foolish husband has done to you. And David says in 1 Samuel 25, 32 through 34, Then David said to Abigail, Blessed is the Lord God of Israel who sent you this day to meet me, And blessed is your advice, and blessed are you, because you have kept me this day from coming to bloodshed and from avenging myself with my own hand. For indeed, as the Lord God of Israel lives, who has kept me back from hurting you, unless you had hurried and come to meet me, surely by morning light no males would have been left to Nabal. David said, had God not kept me back from this sin, there would not have been a single man in Nabal's household. In Psalm 19, David prayed. David prayed to God and asked him, Lord, keep me from sinning against you. That should be a prayer that is on the lips of each one of us each and every day. Lord, keep me back from sinning against you. Lord, keep me from crossing the line 
that you have established. David continues in prayer in verse 13. Let them not, let them not have dominion over me. David is asking God, don't allow this sin to rule over my life. Does that remind you of an account in the Bible? Turn back to Genesis chapter 4 as we look at that for just a moment. Keep your place there in Psalms. We'll be back. But turn to Genesis chapter 4, verse 1, because as we think about sin, ruling over someone, having dominion over someone, Cain is an example of that. Genesis 4, beginning at verse 1, Now Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Then she bore again, this time his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground of the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry. And his countenance fell. So the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door. And its desire is for you. But you should rule over it. Cain had a choice. He could have realized the Lord's displeasure with his offering had nothing to do with the offering of his brother Abel. He could have brought an acceptable offering to the Lord. Instead, sin ruled over him. Look at verse 8. Now Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and killed him. Sin had dominion over Cain. Sin ruled over Cain. In Psalm 19, David prayed and asked God to not let sin have dominion over him. You and I must pray and ask God to not let sin have dominion over us. I would encourage you to pray Psalm 119, verse 38. Establish your word to your servant who is devoted to fearing you. I would encourage you to pray Psalm 119, verse 33. Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I shall keep it to the end. I would encourage you to pray how Jesus teaches us to pray in Matthew 6, 13. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. David prayed and asked God, Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. The next two parts of verse 13 show us the positive results when, when presumptuous sins do not have dominion over us. First, look to the Bible, verse 13. Then I shall be blameless. Blameless in the sense here of verse 13, it means to be complete. It means to be undivided against yourself. As we studied 1 John a number of months ago now, a number of weeks ago as we finished it, if you remember, there were several verses in 1 John that began, if we say that. 1 John 1, 6, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. 1 John 1, 8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. 1 John 1.10, if we say that we have not sinned, 
we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. As we studied more in 1 John, there were several verses that began, He who says, 1 John 2, 4, He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. 1 John 2, 6, He who says he abides in him, ought himself also to walk just as he walked. And then finally, 1 John 2, 9. He who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness in, until now. The individual who is blameless, the individual who has prayed and asked God to keep the presumptuous sins from having dominion over himself or herself, what they say will match how they live. They will not be a walking contradiction. The first positive result of presumptuous sins not having dominion over us is to be blameless. The second is found in the final stanza of verse 13. Look to your Bible. And I shall be innocent of great transgression. Transgression is rebellion against God's standard. Transgression is knowing the line that God has drawn and willfully stepping over it. David's prayer here is that he would not rebel against God, that he would not cross over the guardrails that God had placed in his life. Now, as we follow the life of David, we see an example in David's life. It's probably the example that's already come to your mind. When willful sins begin to stack on, upon one another, when recognition of those sins and the repentance from them does not take place immediately, but is instead pushed to the side in 1 Samuel 5, David now reigns over all of Israel. He is the king of Israel. He is over Israel. He's over Jerusalem. And the Bible says, So David knew that the Lord had established him as king over Israel, and that he had exalted his kingdom for the sake of his people Israel. And David took more concubines and wives from Jerusalem, after he had come from Hebron, also more sons and daughters were born to David. Did you see what we just read? David took more concubines and wives. Now you may say to yourself, well, that's, that's no big deal. There's other instances of that happening in the Bible. It is a big deal because it was not God's design. And for David... What he did had been strictly forbidden by God. In Deuteronomy 17, 14 through 20, God gives principles for how a king was to conduct himself. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 17, 17, Neither shall he multiply wives for himself, lest his heart turn away nor shall he greatly multiply silver and gold for himself. A king was forbidden from multiplying wives for himself, and God gave the reason, because the heart of the king would turn away. Turn with me to 2 Samuel chapter 11. Probably where you thought I was going, we just got there a little bit later. 2 Samuel chapter 11. Let's look at verse 1. It happened in the spring of the year at the times at the time when kings go out to battle that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel and they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. Remember David was the king. Where should David have been? 
He should have been out with his men leading them into battle. Where was David? He stayed back. He stayed back in Jerusalem. Look at verses 2 through 5. Then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful to behold. So David sent and inquired about the woman. And someone said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah, the Hittite? You notice that unnamed someone. God had positioned that unnamed someone to keep David from willful sin. Let's continue on. Then David sent messengers and took her. And she came to him, and he lay with her, for she was cleansed from her impurity. And she returned to her house. And the woman conceived, so she sent and told David and said, I am with child. God had placed someone in David's life to keep him back from willful sin against him. David did not listen. David did not care. As you read through the rest of 1 Samuel 11, you, or 2 Samuel 11, you'll see the transgressions begin to pile on. David crossed over the line that God had drawn. Now he had committed adultery. Soon he would add murder as he brought Joab in on his sins to send Uriah right to the front of the line. Skip there to the very end of uh, 2 Samuel 11. And again, another chapter I'd encourage you to mark. Go back and read this afternoon. Uriah, when the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband. And when her mourning was over, David sent and brought her to his house. And she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. Look closely at those words. The thing that David had done displeased the Lord. As David began to accumulate wives, I don't believe that he realized that he was on a path that would lead to displeasing the Lord. As David stayed behind... While his men went on to battle, I don't believe that he anticipated his decision would lead to him displeasing the Lord. As David stepped out onto the balcony that evening, I don't believe that he anticipated he was choosing a path that was going to lead to adultery and murder. Now God would send a prophet named Nathan, to David. David would confess and repent that he had sinned against God. That confession, his repentance, is recorded in Psalm 51. Again, I'd encourage you to make a note. Go back and read Psalm 51 this afternoon. For now, let's return back to verse number 13. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless, and I shall be innocent of great transgression. Psalm 19, verse 13, is a preemptive prayer. It's a prayer asking God to keep us from great transgression. Psalm 1913 is the type of prayer that we should pray daily in order to avoid the tragedy of Psalm 51 and the prayer that David prayed as he has committed adultery, as he has committed murder, as he cries out to God to be cleansed. Now certainly God can and does cleanse the repentant sinner of their sin. But how much more should we focus on this prayer of Psalm 19, 13, asking God to keep us from crossing over his line? David's consideration of God's word 
brought him to a place of self-examination and prayer, leading him to make a plea that God would keep him from presumptuous sins. Next, David makes a plea for one's words and thoughts to be found acceptable in God's sight. Look to your Bible, verse 14. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. David says, the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart. David's plea is that the words that he speaks, as well as the words he doesn't speak, his very thoughts would be acceptable in God's sight. When you see that word acceptable, it brings to mind an offering. Now for us in 21st century America, our mind may go directly to the giving boxes in the back. When we think of that word offering, we may simply think of the financial gift that we give back to the Lord for the work of the ministry. That's a component of an offering. The Bible says in Romans 12, 1 and 2, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You see, when we see that word acceptable, and it points to an offering, it's pointing back to a sacrifice. In the Old Testament, it had in view an animal sacrifice, an animal sacrifice that was to be complete. You did not offer half of a sheep or half of a goat. A sacrifice that was to be the very best one had. Not that which was left over. David's desire, as should be the desire of every child of God, is that our words would be acceptable to our Father. That we would be able to set our very words as an offering to God. David's plea, as should be the plea of every child of God, is that our very thoughts would be acceptable, that we could set our very thoughts before him as an appropriate sacrifice. To carry this forward, we see the instructions found in Philippians 4, 8, and 9 of what we're to set our minds upon. The Bible says, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, Whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. And the God of peace will be with you. Notice again who David is making his plea to. He's not making his plea to the false gods of, his, of the day. He's not making his plea to the false god of self, seeking to muster up the strength to do this on his own. David is making a plea to the one true God, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer that word my strength it literally means rock that's what the word means so when the pressure to conform to this world in the way that you talk in the way that you think when the pressure to conform comes bearing down upon you we must cling to god who is our rock the Bible says in Psalm 18, verses 1 through 3, I will love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. 
my God, my strength in whom I will trust, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. The Lord is our strength. Look back to verse 14 one final time. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. That word Redeemer points to God being our deliverer from sin, from death, from danger. Now David knew an earthly Redeemer already in his life. His great-grandfather, Boaz, had redeemed his great-grandmother, Ruth, when she became his wife. But we know through the line of David would come the Redeemer. Through the line of David would come the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, born of the Holy Spirit to the Virgin Mary. The Lord Jesus Christ, whose name means God is salvation. The Lord Jesus Christ, who came to do what we could not do, and that is redeem ourselves from sin and death. Jesus is our blessed hope and great God and Savior. The Bible says of Jesus in Titus 2.12, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. You see, we were dead in sin and trespasses. The Lord Jesus Christ paid our redemption price the Bible says of our redemption price in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 through 19, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. The Lord Jesus Christ, by His shed blood, paid the price of redemption for His people. And as the Lord Jesus Christ redeemed us from sin and death, He did not say, okay, go away and live your life now on your own. Do the best that you can, but just stay away from me. Now listen to what the Lord Jesus Christ said. He said, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If you want to be cleansed from secret faults, abide in Christ. Stay connected to the Lord Jesus Christ in prayer and in the reading of His Word. If you want to be kept from presumptuous sins, abide in Christ. Stay connected to the Lord Jesus Christ as you read His Word and pray. If you want the words of your mouth, and the meditation of your heart to be acceptable in God's sight. Abide in Christ. Stay connected to the Lord Jesus Christ as you read His Word and as you pray. The Lord Jesus Christ is your strength. The Lord Jesus Christ is your Redeemer. Psalm 19 begins by letting us know that the very heavens declare the glory of God. You cannot look to the sky without recognizing there is a God who created this world. 
Psalm 19 continues by pointing us to God's Word. You cannot read through His holy Word and not come to realization that God created the heavens and everything in them, and He makes the rules. You cannot study God's Word and not come to the realization that each and every person has sinned against the God who created them. But guess what? You also cannot read God's holy and perfect word and not see that the God who created this world, the God who you have sinned against, loves you so much that rather than leave you dead in sin and trespasses, He made you alive in Christ. He extended to you the gift of salvation when Jesus came and died upon the cross for our sins, buried and rose again the third day, just as the Bible says. So even as Psalm 19 begins in the furthest depths of the heavens, it finishes right here in the hearts and minds of each and every person, making the decision, are we going to abide in Christ? Are we going to turn away? I pray, the, the, the body of Christ that's here at Balfour Baptist Church, I pray that we would abide in Christ, stay connected to Him. And I pray if you're here today and you have never turned from your sin, you have never believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray that today would be the day that you acknowledge the one true God and ask to be forgiven, knowing that, that he will. Why? Because he said he would. Let's pray. Kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. Lord, we thank you that you are our strength, that you are our redeemer. Father, I pray that it would be the prayer of this church, Lord, that we would ask you to cleanse us from our secret faults. Father, I pray that we would ask you to keep us from our transgressions, from presumptuous sins. And Father, I pray that the words of our mouths and the meditations of our heart will be acceptable in your sight. Father, strengthen and revive your church. Lord, help us to abide in you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.